Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Here we are on Monday, July the 5th, getting together around God's Word again. Welcome to another Discipleship Empowerment Word. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Dr. James Paul Humphreys. And we're glad that as we journey through the Word of God, that we may look at different words and see how these words do affect us and speak into our lives and help us to grow in our faith. You know, it's so important that we keep growing in our faith, that we keep pulling the weeds out of the garden, and that we keep nurturing the garden, watering the garden, and getting everything prepared so that it, the plants will grow and produce fruit. And the Bible says to produce fruit that will last. So as we continue on our journey of looking at this word holy and holiness, we find ourselves in the book of Nehemiah today. And we're going to be looking at how this word holy affected the people back in their times and how I believe it should affect us also in our times. As you know, we have the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. Ezra was the prophet, the teacher, who God brought back from captivity to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And then the Lord raised up Nehemiah, to, uh, who was a cupbearer, to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And I like that idea because what I what I wanted to try to, before we get in to look at the word holy in, in Nehemiah, is how God uses different people with different giftings to do different things. And if you were to read Ezra and Nehemiah, you would see our modern day terminology of body ministry. People everywhere from just servants to household uh, people who just lived in their houses working and building the walls. Some were carrying their weapons. Others were watching out. Nehemiah himself was touring around and keeping uh, people encouraged and built up. And those who were trying to speak about, speak against what was going on, he also confronted. And then Ezra you know, he kept bringing forth and preparing the people to come to a place of recognizing God's holiness. It's interesting that even when they were doing a good work, if you want to call it a good work, rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the walls, how many of the people of Israel, both people who were of the, of the family of God, of the people of God, Israel, who were there helping to rebuild, and others who were still of the people of God, who were criticizing. You know, I've noticed in my old age, as I get older, that you cannot make everybody happy. You know, somebody has always got something to say about something, and you know, but you got to stick to the vision. You got to stick to what God lays on your heart. And to keep moving forward in spite of maybe what some may say or not say. You know, that's the whole thing. And I realized also one of the biggest maybe joys is to be able to fall down and get back up again. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and to brush yourself off and say, okay, let's keep moving forward. Well, the people of Israel had fallen down. In fact, they had fallen down and betrayed God so much and, and f fell into trespasses and, and all kinds of other things. They were going through, as it were, a tribulation of 70 years where they were hauled off to Babylon because of their wickedness, because of their sinfulness and disobedience and that they got hauled off. But I want you to see hope here is not only were they hauled off for 70 years to get their attention that they must serve the holy God of Israel, that then God opened the door to allow Ezra to come back. And not only Ezra to come back, but to also to find the law and to be able to present the law, to read the law, and Nehemiah to not only have the vision to come back and the wisdom to come back, but also how to instruct his king concerning the materials that would be needed and all the things that were going to take place. And it was interesting, it all came together at a specific time. And that this specific time is, a, is very unique in the history of Israel, the coming back 
and saying, yes, Lord, we have betrayed you. Yes, Lord, we have sinned. God, forgive us. And you know what? God forgives. God shows mercy. And I don't know if we ever get that, comp that completely into our mind, the mercy of God. And we're going to see that as we read the word of God. Because you met, can you imagine coming back to Jerusalem? For some of them, it would be their first time because they would be children of the parents who were hauled away. Some of it would be the parents who would come back and they would see how the temple, something that was so beautiful and unique where God's presence was destroyed. And then to come back to the, to the city of Jerusalem, which is up on a mountain, Mount Zion, as many of us know it as, as you come in and uh, you would see the the mount the the Jerusalem on a hillside to be a light unto the nations being totally destroyed and it was i mean there was all the walls and everything were torn down and uh tr complete destruction and then uh God raises up these two men with two different kinds of gifting to come back and motivate the people hey, don't just give up and lay in the ruins. Let's begin to rebuild. And that's the thing is that sometimes we have those destructive times because of maybe our disobedience or our sinfulness or whatever it may be that we get hauled off into captivity or the Lord allows us to stay, but now we're living amongst ruins. Well, let me tell you that as I look at these two books of Ezra and Nehemiah, I see that God doesn't want us to live within the ruins, but that God wants to always rebuild. And rebuild is by turning back to him, turning back to his word, turning back to who he is as a holy God. And we're going to see as we go into Nehemiah chapter 8, we're probably just going to stay here today because I just think there's so much truth here that we need to grasp when, when it comes to this whole idea of holiness. Now, they, they get the setting of what's going on. As I said, they're rebuilding the walls. They're doing, you know, there's people that are ridiculing. There's others that are, you know, they're not sure if they're going to be attacked by other people because, you know, people like it that they can, that they didn't have to have walls and gates to go through. And so... You know, there was a lot of stuff going on and Nehemiah had to get him to the place, you know, while you're working, you know, keep your sword and spear in one hand and work with the other. Um, I don't know how easy that would be in our modern society that while you're working at your factory or at your place or whatever, and someone comes up to say, and say, you know, keep your sword and your spear right next to you because at any moment we could be attacked. You know, and I think that just shows us that, you know, the enemy loves to attack at any time when we least suspect it. But to be prepared, to be prepared. And and Nehemiah, you know, encouraged the people to be prepared, but to keep working, to keep, you know, involved in building the walls. And he got them, a lot of them, to build the walls in front of their own houses. And, you know, that would motivate them because now they know that what they're building in front of their house is going to protect them and their family. And again, that's something that we need to think about is that as parents and other people uh, that we're connected with, that we're there to put up these, a wall, not as a wall of dividing, but a wall of protection. You know, don't be afraid. A lot of times we, we talk about how God tears down walls. He does tear down walls between people groups and, and he prepares people's hearts that they may walk together in him. There is no dividing wall when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. But when it comes to the things of, of this world, there should be a dividing wall between us and the world. We should be able to, even even we're told that, that the gates of hell will be able to be pushed back and the walls to be pushed back because God is trying to bring about holiness within an unholy world. But there needs to be protection. You know, they could have had faith and say, well, we're just going to trust God. We'll rebuild our house and we don't have to do anything else. No, they had to trust God, first of all, that his word was true and it was dependable. 
And then they had to trust God that building the walls is what was going to protect them, you know, from the enemies. And I believe the word of God is what puts up a, 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 a barrier and a sense of protection. Not a barrier to keep people out from Christ, but a barrier to keep the enemy from destroying both us and our homes and other things. And so they're building this and all this unique stuff is coming up. And then we get to Ezra chapter 8. And here is something that I, I want to deal with the whole chapter. And, and uh, here's something that I just think as we begin to look through this, I just want to highlight some points because as we get into verses 9 to through to 12, we'll see the word holy being used. But I want to I wanna bring us up to the place of how this word holy gets used. And, and it's interesting that the very beginning of, of chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now all the people gathered together as one man. They come in unity. They came as one man. And of course, we know they came as one man and women, probably children, all gathered together. They op And they came to the open square that was in front of the water gate. And the water gate, of course, you would go out to get your water and bring it back into the city. But it was also uh, symbolic as how, how God would water and give water to his people. And so they got to the water gate. And here the people are, you know, on their own. They have gathered together. They, they weren't called into a meeting. But they just began to gather together. And I don't know who called out to Ezra. But somebody called out, or the people called out, and said to Ezra at the water gate, they told Ezra, with the scribe, to bring the books of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel, to bring them out. Which was unusual in itself, because a lot of these, uh, the scrolls were kept in, in very holy places, and, and not normally brought out amongst the people. But here, Ezra is exhorted, Hey, Ezra, go get the, the Pentateuch, as it were. Go get the scriptures of Moses and bring it out. Bring it out before the people. Don't keep it hid. You know, there's a lot of religions over the world that, that try to hide the scriptures or try to use other languages. You know, there was amazing how many uh, uh, churches and organizations. You know, we had one church that all they would do is read the scripture in Latin. And we have another uh, organization that reads scripture in another language. You know, but here God was telling the people and the people were telling Ezra, get the word of God out to us. Come and get it out to us. Get out to where the people are. And I think that's something prophetic that we need to do as leaders and elders and deacons is not just have the word displayed in our churches or have it on the communion table we need to get the word out to the people. And the people are asking for it. The people were asking for it. These are not holy, righteous people yet. They were just people of Israel who knew about some books and things like that, that Moses had wrote. And they knew that they had fallen away in sin, that they had been carried off into captivity. That part they understood. And they knew it was because of disobedience and that. And now they were back and they knew that God was seemingly doing a restoration project with the, the temple and the walls. And they knew that the only way that this is all going to work is to bring the word out of the closet and bring the word out to the people. Isn't that interesting? And I think sometimes that's what's happening today. I know different churches, you know, they haven't been able to have services inside. You know, they've had to go outside. I, I see a friend of watching here. They've gone out to a farmer's field and erected a platform. You know, it sounds exactly like what Ezra and Nehemiah did. They got the word out and they've, I've heard testimony how God is doing marvelous things <laughs> out in the fields. I know another church, a church I'm going to be preaching at, uh, next Sunday in St. Anne. They've been doing, uh, their services outside on the front porch of the church and people all line up in their cars outside and they park out there. You know what I mean? And I'm just thinking, Lord, is this what you were doing in Nehemiah's time? <laughs> 
Because look what it goes on. It says, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of the men and women, and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And uh, I just go on. And then he read from the open square that was in the front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And so the, the word of God comes out. The people have asked for the word of God comes out. And as he begins to, to read the word, the people were beginning to get understanding about the word. Okay. You know, and see when a, when a word is kept hidden, and, and people don't get a chance to, to really understand the word because it was when we understand the word and the word gets into us and we get into the word, that's what sets the captive free. See, even though they came back from captivity, even though that God brought the people after 70 years of captivity, they still had not yet been set free. What? Yeah, you can say, yeah, they were taken off in the captivity, just like, and they were into Babylon, and Babylon, they came back from Babylon, and they would have brought a whole bunch of garbage with them back from Babylon. And they were still, even though they were in the midst of Jerusalem, where the tabernacle or the temple was being rebuilt, and the walls were being put back up, there was still captivity. And the only thing that could set them free is the word. And the only way that the word could set them free is to get it out so that they could hear it, so that everyone could hear it and get understanding and make decisions. You know, because it's the word of God anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's why I tell people when we give out David's song and that, and we hand it out, we need to be in prayer. I mean, a seed that isn't anointed with water does not germinate. So we need to be praying. When the word of God goes out, those of you who are mature in the word of God, you need to go and be praying and asking God. Those of you who are having outdoor services, you know, uh, yesterday I was preaching in, in La Brokery and there was people inside and then there was a whole bunch of people outside sitting on lawn chairs with speakers, you know, and so all the neighbors and everybody else around. The word was not only inside, but now was going outside. I love what that has created. And, you know, there's been people that have gone out and they've done it all through the winter. You know, they've had, you know, stages with their, their, their pianos and everything else and their, and their equipment's on there. And it's winter out there and the word of God is going out. And he was beginning to give them understanding. And it's interesting because not only that understanding, but he says in verse three here, and the ears of the people were attentive. That means that now they had got the attention. God had got their attention. They'd gone through, you know, captivity. They'd gone through traveling back and forth. They'd gone through destruction. They've gone through their, their farms are being destroyed. Everything was happening that they were going through. So now they knew that the only way out of all this captivity, both what they had experienced physically and experienced emotionally, the only way to freedom was to get an understanding of the word. And so he goes on, verse 4, So Ezra the scribe stood on the platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him. So they had made a platform. You know, they had built a platform. I, I, and I see someone watching this one. They built a platform <laughs> out in the field. You know, right here, they're doing the same thing, building a platform. But here they would then they put some of the elders and some of the leaders, some of the trusted people of God, and then it goes on here and tells he put some on the right and then he put another group on the left. Then as it goes on, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. So this book, the, the, the law, was not to be hidden. It was not to be spoken in a language that no one could read, you know, and, and that's what's gone on. It was actually up until just a few hundred years ago that the Bible was either chained to the pulpit or the Bible was put in a language that put what people couldn't understand, that the common people were not allowed to read it. And so often, you know, God wants to give understanding to all people. And he'll use the common word. That's why organizations spend so much time in translating the Bible so that the common people can read it. That as they get into the word of God, the word of God gets into them. 
That's why organizations uh, that I know, in, especially in Manitoba, they, they go out and give the word to people. They send out Bibles to all over the place because even at Gideon's, you know, they put the Bibles in every hotel because they know if people get into the word, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will give them a beginning place of understanding and that understanding will begin to change their lives. I know today we're trying to talk about the word holy and we're going to get there. But I just wanted to show that as Ezra began to talk, everything didn't come through him. Uh-oh, now I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was a bunch of guys on his right and there was a bunch of guys on the left. And what were they were there for? Well, the purpose was there is that when they went out and, and Ezra began to do reading, then after he would read maybe certain portions or amount of portions, then they went to small house groups. Well, he doesn't say that, small host groups. But the people were divided up amongst these other people. And what did they do? They helped give understanding. You know, it's just not one pastor who preaches, but every one of us need to be involved, especially if we're elders and deacons in the church, to help other people to give understanding to other people. That's what was going on here. Had him on the right and left. And so in verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. They needed to see it. They opened the book so everybody else could see. You know, I know a lot of us are carrying our Bibles around and everything on the phones right now. And you don't know if they're playing a video game during the service or they're looking at Facebook or whatever. But there's nothing better than bringing the book to church and opening the book. You know what I'm saying? Now, again, that's going to rock some feathers and stuff like that and rock some people. That's okay. But we need to get into the word and we're, let the word get into us. So he opened the book in the sight of the people for the, for he was standing above all at the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. So he, there was even a reverence and holiness when it came to opening the word of God. Many had never seen it for all of their lives. It wasn't something that was in Babylon. You know, it wasn't something that was in Egypt. It was already amongst them. They just needed to bring the book out and open it up in their sight. And as the people came to that water gate and to, to the place of, of both men, women, and children, there would be children because men and women, they were there. The children would be there too. And they began to read it and give understanding. And as they began to get into the word of God and the word of God gets into them, something powerful begins to take place. And I think that's so important that we need to gather together and allow the Word of God to come into our lives and let it do its work in us. So the people, they all stood up. They just said, okay. And the, and the idea of standing at that time was to show reverence and respect and honor. You know, when a dignitary comes into the room, and it used to be that in churches too, and I'm not going to say we go back to that, but it used to be that in, even in churches where when the word of God was to be open and that people stood up because they knew by standing, first of all, they would have their, they'd be more attentive. They wouldn't be sitting there talking and, and stuff like that when they stood up when the word would be read. And because they were more attentive, they would hear better. And he goes on, and Ezra blessed the Lord with great, the great God that they, that all the people answered amen and amen while lifting up their hands. Now, people tell me often that there is no place in the Bible, you know, where it talks about lifting up hands. Well, it does here twice. That when the word of God, you know, was being read, they stood up. And then after it was read, they began to worship God. And what the, were they doing? They were lifting up their hands and their hands Lifting up hands is a sign to surrender to God and his word. We surrender. Lord, we praise you. Your word is true. You are awesome. You are sacred. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Looking to the ground. The, this word was beginning to have a powerful impact on the people. That's why we need to keep preaching the word. We, all of us, need to get out there. And again, in verse 7, it lists all, all the different people and talks about, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law and the people stood in their places. And they stood there from early morning to late to afternoon, probably until it got too hot. 
And then they went home for a little bit and came back and stood there again. There was such a, a, a delight and hunger for the word. They stood there. They didn't, they didn't kept, you know, when is Ezra going to stop reading? When is Ezra going to stop? When are these people going to stop going around talking to us? When is this all going to come to an end? Don't you know we got to go on holidays? Don't you know that we got to go to the restaurant? Don't you know we got other things to do? But you know, there's nothing more important than getting into the word of God and letting the word of God get into us. Amen. And so they were beginning to get understanding. He goes on in verse 8. So, so they read distinctly from the book, the, the law of God, and they gave sense. They gave it understanding and helped the, to help them to understand the reading of the word. The reading. To give them understanding. See, people need help to understand. The disciples needed Jesus to give them understanding about the parables. Paul needed to give understanding to the church. There's nothing wrong. God uses shepherds and under shepherds to give understanding, to shepherd the sheep, to help them to grow. But also God uses elders and deacons and other uh, mature people in the body of Christ to give understanding to the word of God. You know, we I, a lot of times <laughs> we don't want to get into the word of God because if we get into the word of God, then comes a responsibility that we need to understand the word of God and then what happens next that we may be drawn to the place that now we're going to have to help others to have understanding. Well, he goes on in verse 9. And now we're getting to our verses and we're almost at end of time. But I'm just going to keep going. It's going to be longer today. And he says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people and said to the people. So they, be, they taught the people and they said to the people, there's something special about this day. You have called us out to bring the word. God is using the body here to give understanding to the word. God has raised up Ezra to rebuild the temple. God has raised up Nehemiah to be the governor and rebuild the walls. Something is happening. They began to realize something was powerfully happening in their midst. And what did they call it? What did they call what was going on? It comes up in verse 9. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept, for they heard the words of the law. What was beginning to happen as they were getting into the word and the word was getting into them? They saw how far away they had fallen from the word of God. How far away they had fallen from God himself. And so as they began to get understanding, it began to touch their hearts and they began to weep. And Ezra and the other leaders were saying, hey, yes, there is. Thank God that he's doing something. But this is more than that. This is a holy day. God's presence is right here, right now with you. And so as they were weeping, they were beginning to weep. And, and do not mourn, he said. This is special. Do not mourn and weep. For all the people wept, for they had heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat, or go your way, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to those of whom nothing has been prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. He uses it a second time. He says, Not only take what you have, but begin to rejoice. Begin to party and say, Thank God for the word. Thank God that we've been set free. Thank God is in our midst. And for those who weren't come able to come this day, go take that what you have and go out and bless them. Go out and tell them about the word. Go out and tell them, bring food, bring sweet wine. Bring it all to their house and have fellowship. Like we used to do back in the olden days. You remember after the church service that people would gather around in all kinds of homes and not only have roast pastor, but they would also talk about the word of God. And, you know, they began to celebrate what God had done, how God had spoken into them. And he says, you know, for this day is holy. It's the day that's been set aside. It's a day that, that God has spoken to us. This day is holy. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here is that famous verse that famous thought that here they were sorrowing and they were in pain and they were wondering what to do and they were feeling, 
you know, they knew that there needed to be a time of confessing and a time of getting things right and asking God for forgive them. They got that all from the word of God. They were beginning to weep and, and humble themselves before God and, and actually mourn and say, oh God, you know, we have been so far away from you. And then Ezra says, yes, but this day is holy. Revival is beginning. Awakening is beginning here. This day is holy. Now go out and rejoice. Go out and rejoice as a family. Go out and rejoice with your neighbors. Go out and, and tell them the joy of the Lord. And not only that, they began to proclaim, I believe, to all their enemies, to all the, the religious leaders and everything that were all about them. People who were trying to pull them down. Oh, don't put that platform out in the field. Don't put that platform on the, fr the front steps. All those kinds of things. You know, don't do that. And what God was going to say through Ezra, you know, hey, this is a special day. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not all the things that were going on, not all the legalism, not all the governments, not all the stuff, but what was becoming their strength was the word of God. And the word of God was strengthening them. And Ezra said that as I see this, this day is a holy day before the Lord. For the Lord is your strength. Then just two more verses. So the Levites quieted all the people. So the Levite, everybody was out, you know, quiet, quiet. They're mourning. <laughs> they're, you know, they're trying to figure out, oh, what to do. You know, there's been a tremendous move of God right now. Revival was breaking down, breaking out. And the Levites began to quieten the people. And they said to him, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Be still and take it in that today is a holy day. And do not be grieved, but go out and be a blessing to others. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And in verse 12, And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and rejoiced greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. What made it a holy day? What made it a place where three times... It says this is a holy day. What made it possible that the joy of the Lord would be their strength was that they got into the word and the word got into them and they understood it. You know, when you get into the word and the word gets into you and you understand it, there's going to be change. And not only did they have change of weeping, change of lifting up their hands and worshiping and praising God, but change of going out and beginning to celebrate. Our God is a great God. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Not Babylon, not Egypt, not all these other wealthy and religious people around. But what is our strength? It is the word of God. And because we gather around the word of God, that day became holy. And that began to bring forth a tremendous amount of praise. Because the joy of the Lord was their strength. And it filtered out into all the community. Isn't that exciting? So I pray today that as we've looked at that, that you've got a little bit more of an understanding of what God was doing through Ezra and Nehemiah and the people. And I believe is no different today. God was wanting to do something powerful through his church today. He's wanting to do something powerful from his word and maybe he's trying to get the word from the inside to be brought outside maybe the people are beginning to hunger so much they're crying out to their leaders bring out the word bring it out wherever bring it out to the parks bring it out to the platforms bring it out to the parking lots bring it out to the airwaves bring it out to facebook just bring it out because it's the word of god that sets the captive free it's the word of god when people understand where they will then begin to rise up and shout the joy of the lord is our strength let's pray father we thank you lord for what we can see from ezra and nehemiah we thank you for what we can see oh god 
from your word. And we pray, O oh God, that as we gather around your word, that we too will begin to understand that we're in the presence of your word, Lord, and your word is in our heart. Lord, out of that comes a holy day, a special day, a unique time where we need to praise you and give thanks, to take blessings to others, not only to our own communities, but to around the world. Lord, that we can be a blessing to share that which we have been given, that which we understand, and to share it with our neighbors, with our friends, with those around the world. And Lord, that we will be able to also, in the midst of all this COVID-19 and all this confusion and everything else that seems to go on around about, not only in the communities, but in the peoples and in the churches, that Lord, instead of standing up and complaining about that, we will stand up and say that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you, Lord. I ask that you would be with us now as we continue to go forward in our days in your glory. And we give you thanks. Now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I pray that the word of God has touched you this morning or in the evening that we can see that we need to cry out more for the word and let the word of God speak into us. Let the word of God be taught to us. Let those around about us who have the maturity to teach us. That's what discipleship training is all about, is getting into the word and letting the word get into us. Amen. Love you. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.